Hello everyone, this is Sonam Gelsen. Today I am here at Chang Limithang standing in front of the portable toilets which was introduced by Mr. Pasang Siring, the founder of the Bhutan Toilet Organization. Now let's move on to our conversation between Mr. Pasang Siring and our anchor Ms. Pema Chenzom. Yeah, let's go. Hello, I am Pema Chenzong from BA Mascom, second year from RTC. Today we have guest Mr. Basang, uh, Basang Sri. He is the founder of Bhutan Toilet Organization, founded in 2014. He's also known as Chaplo, Chapsai Lopin. Right. And then he is also a uh, author of a book named uh, Basu Diary. Right. Um, and then he is also uh, one of the famous blogger in Bhutan. You can say that. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I hope you're doing good. La, yep. And your mm. organization as well. La. Yes. Uh, so, the first question I have for this interview is. Uh, what are the, uh, some of the challenges while running your organization mm. and how do you tackle it? All right, so um, Bhutan Toilet Organization was founded to take care of uh, Bhutanese toilets, especially those that are uh, left at the mercy of the public, you know, because uh, mm, uh, Bhutanese are generally not uh, really good at uh, taking care of toilets. So this is why we started. And uh, we managed to fix a lot of toilet issues in the country. And we also have been partnered to a lot of government uh, initiatives uh, through which uh, the government also uh, achieved quite a lot in this uh, few years, including the mm, uh, passing of uh, national sanitation policy, which is a significant uh, uh, achievement uh, at a national level. In, in, in running the organization, there's uh, the issue of um, uh, not having adequate resources. Look for your own funding and take care of it. Government doesn't pay you anything to run this organization. So when you get projects, we do saving that will run the office. Also do those activities that are required by the projects. So all the civil society organizations, there are 54 civil society organizations uh, not funded by government. We have to look for our own money, and that <clears throat> will always remain a challenge for the civil society organizations, and uh, Bhutan Toilet is no different. You have made uh, 528 units of toilets in four uh, different zonkaks, and <clears throat> in 50 schools. But that, that looks like uh, old data. I think we must have uh, fixed uh, over 2,800 toilets in schools. That is, again, units, OK? okay. So in, in, in over 200 schools, we did that, yes. So that uh, was funded by your own organization or by their uh, experience? So yes. So this uh, was actually in partnership with Ministry of Education and UNICEF, uh, United uh, Nations organization that is, uh, takes care of children, isn't it, mm -hmm. and their affairs. So uh, because school toilets are very much in line with their mandate, so they help school do that. So then we come in with this new idea to uh, fix toilets. So ministry likes that idea, and that's how we work together. Okay. You're saying, asking me if I'm satisfied with the uh, you know, facilities in the country. Um, uh, that is very relative. If I compare what we have right now with what we had uh, when we started, I'm very satisfied because we have achieved a lot. Okay, But if I am to compare the same with another country, you know, be it uh, Singapore, Japan, or 
even Thailand, it's, uh, where most Bhutanese have been to, uh, then no, because we are far behind and um, uh, this, there's a, uh, I think we, we, it'll take quite some time to achieve that because uh, we do not have uh, two things. We do not have that much resource to invest in toilets. One, because if you look at those toilets outside in here, we do not have one toilet that is comparable to what is outside. Two, uh, even if we had some toilets like that, <coughs> there's a huge, uh, there's no guarantee that our people will uh, use it uh, in a manner that it will be sustainable. So that is the two things that's happened. I'd like you to <coughs> share how did you get motivated to write a book? Mm. So I actually didn't plan to publish a book. Or uh, uh, It was uh, from 2009 onwards I was writing the blog, Pasu Diary. So in there, you know, there were like 700 to 800 articles. In 2018, uh, so just just uh, wanted to experiment with this idea of having a blog published into a book because it's uh, it's uh, as a blogger as a senior blogger there were a lot of young people uh, following what I do so I wanted to set this example of that possibility. The other one is if you publish that into a book and if the book does well, then there is a very definite. Uh, uh, source of income. So that is something that uh, I wanted uh, young bloggers to catch up, you know. So that's the idea. Whole my life since high school, have this dream of having a book of my own. But uh, because uh, you want the book to be good, you keep waiting, 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 rewriting it, and it's never happening. But in between, uh, because my blog was already published, so I need not work so hard on that. So when I put my blog articles together, the book came out uh, so quick. And then my childhood dream has come true because I have a book of my own now. So that was the most um, satisfying uh, part of that book. Sarah, what was the most interesting thing about writing this book? And what is the favorite part of the book? It must be uh, two or three articles on their uh, called Tertin Sharap Mebar. I also write some historical narratives that uh, I try to convert from the oral oral transmission into my own. So I've done a little bit of historical yet uh, investigative uh, writing in there. Uh, these three are my favorite. And I'm thinking that uh, maybe one day if I, have, uh, if I have time, I might pursue it further to convert life of Tetan Sharap Mebar into a book because he's not uh, that celebrated in our history book. But it's fascinating, the, world, the life he had. So it's worth exploring further. So maybe that's why it's my favorite. Uh, the last question about the book is, do you think the book got the recognition that it deserved? By this, what I mean is, in the Buddhist market, uh, is there a strong uh, sustainability for the novelist? Uh, my book is not expected to uh, sell much because I, I, I already know the reality of Buddhist book market. I know the reality that books will not do well. But despite that, it was surprising that I, my book sold quite well. Uh, when I was trying to publish my book, uh, I had to think of editing, designing, then negotiating with the printer after printing, then marketing the book. The whole process takes quite uh, a bit of your energy and your uh, perseverance. So having learned that, now I didn't want to waste this knowledge. So uh, there is another initiative that I've taken called Bookness. Bookness is uh, a company of its own. Uh, actually, it's an e-commerce, e-commerce uh, venture where I sell Buddhist books. So you will see that all the Buddhist authors 
can register their book on Bookness at bookness.com. And there we make writer's profile, uh, uh, the, the book's profile. Then we stock up, we uh, stock, uh, uh, keep an inventory so that we can sell those books. This is the end of our session. Thank you so much, Mr. Gasson Sreen, for the interview.